Hello, everybody. This is uh, Levi Litvoy, and I am right here with Derek Beach, who is my good friend and partner in crime and professor at Aarhus University. And uh, the, the, the reason we came, uh, we, uh, I mean, the reason we're talking is to talk about, uh, talk about process tracing. So, Derek, uh, why would a young scholar care about process tracing? Well, the, the short answer is, is that it can answer a different type of research question, right? So, so I don't believe that there's one method that is, is the best method. There's not one gold standard, right? There's, there's different methods that answer different questions. If I want to really under, get in the mind of a, a Trump voter uh, and, and understand motivations and, 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 and worldviews and how this can make sense for people, of course, I choose a methodology that would help me leverage that. It could be something like an ethnography or, or uh, interpretive interviewing. If I want to understand the causal effect, net causal effect of some, some, uh, some variable um, that can vary, you know, a cause, uh, I would do an experiment or find a natural experiment type of design to, to, to leverage that and answer that question. Process tracing, the core that we're asking, question that we're asking there is basically, how does it work? Uh, is, is, is that you're, you're saying, okay, there is some kind of cause out there that you've identified. There's an outcome. Uh, it could be a crisis leading to some kind of policy change. And then the process tracing would be enabling you to answer the question, how does it work? How do we get from some kind of crisis? What is the process that links that with an actual, for example, policy change. So that's kind of the core of what process tracing is as a, as a, I would say more as a design and a methodology is it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a self-contained framework of, of ontology and you know, like ideas about the world, the causal claims we're making and epistemology about how we learn about them. This, this, this kind of a, 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 a core of assumptions and that, that form the foundations of process tracing as a research design to answer the how does it work question. Yeah, so if, uh, if I view it in the light from the perspective of other methodologies, so most methodologies that we deal with in the social sciences is looking at, is there a relationship between A and B? Take, take your pick, your dependent variable and your independent variable, but this goes beyond, right? Well, or, or I would say not necessarily beyond just asking a different question, because I, yes. I, I do like thinking about complementarity as far as, so, so let me just show you an example and I'll, I'll share my screen. So this is a, from, a, from a PhD uh, scholar at the time, um, Olga Lablova, who, who uh, studied at CEU, and she was working within a a kind of a theoretical framework where a lot of people had been talking about um, the, the, the cause of, of like an epistemic community. So these you know, like a body of experts uh, that form some kind of knowledge based community uh, of, of actors and how that they can and, and then influence so policy influence. And there'd been a lot of research and theorization about how about about epistemic communities and gaining influence, but nobody had ever actually kind of taken the step back and asked, like, how does it work? Is, what's the linkage there? How does an epistemic community, what are they actually doing to gain influence on policy? And so this was the question that, that Olga uh, uh, took up was basically, uh, how do I get from A to B? Like, what is a process, like one plausible, of course, there could be multiple different ways you could get from A to B, but one, one plausible was basically she's, her, her argument that she published in the journal policy studies journal, it's not bad journal, um, was, was saying, okay, we have a cause, an epistemic community is formed, and then the outcome influence, and then how does it work? And what she did, this is her kind of the, the, the final theory in her article, as she's saying, well, in like, first we have our epistemic community, it then starts promoting their, their favorite public policy uh, with conferences and workshops, or whatever. Then there's activities that they're doing to gain access to actual decision makers. So, so for example, getting in the room, being the ones that are actually advising uh, policymakers about how you can reach this kind of outcome. And then decision makers, because 
they've basically delegated all of the knowledge and expertise over to of like, how do we do this to the epistemic community actors? That then gives the epistemic community, basically, they're the people that are writing, you know, moving the pen. And, and then so decision makers are adopting a policy that has been guided and shaped by what the epistemic community wants. And of course, this, is, this would be a typical process tracing design looking at one or two cases where her argument is, is not that there's a, a net causal relationship, but she's saying, well, this is one way it could work through gaining access to decision makers and actually kind of getting in the room, being there, being the expert that's then advising decision makers. Of course, if you look at this theory, you could say, well, there's a lot of holes here. There's a lot of things that you and I would want to know, like what are they actually doing to promote their favorite policy? How are you gaining access to decision makers? Those would be things that you'd maybe want to in further research unpack. Olga's contribution, the reason why it was published in a top journal was she was able to say, well, nobody's told us what's going on in that arrow and here's a plausible pathway. So that's kind of the value added of, of process tracing. And there's a lot of research questions and, and fields where uh, this is, we don't know very much about what's going on in between. So as just a publication strategy also, asking these kinds of questions often opens doors for, for publication in, in, in good journals. So let me ask you this. So on a very practical level, and I'm thinking like from two perspectives over here, uh, one, generating your hypotheses or your research questions, but also in terms of actually doing the research and, 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 and working with evidence and data and information, what does this look like? So let's take it in that order. Yeah, so, so a typical process tracing is actually, um, and this, this is a vocabulary that interpretivists also feel very comfortable with, is much more what we would call an abductive process. So it's, a, it's basically a back and forth, right? So, so I think Olga, for example, she started with a, some kind of idea, there's something going on in between. Um, and, and she then selected a setting, a case, health policy, healthcare policy, and in, in Poland, and I think it was the Czech Republic, uh, and then started to probe in the case, uh, trying to understand what people are doing, and then making sense of that theoretically. And so, you, it, so then you return to your theory, you start developing a sketch of your theory. You then say, oh, well, there's something, uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going on. You go out and you do more field work. Um, and, and then you slowly revise your theory. So, so the, the kind of the research process typically is, is, is you might start at your desk, you have a kind of a theme, you have an, a, a kind of a something like a cause outcome you think is, is interesting. Uh, you don't really know how it works. You might either decide to dig into theory and just kind of sit and brainstorm and then go out and do some field work or vice versa. But it's always gonna be a, a juxtaposition. So you don't sit at your desk for too long you do need to get to know the real world because at the end of the uh, end of the day, but process tracers would tell you it should be the real world's talking to you and the evidence in the real world, what's actually happening should be what's shining through. So the idea that you can just, you know, do a theory test and you're done is, is, is not, is not really process tracing. It would be more developing an explanation in, in a kind of a dialogue between theory and empirics. It typically takes a long time. You really need to get to know your case in, and, and the kind of the area to understand what is going on, uh, to understand the different dynamics, what's important, what is not. Because otherwise it can, it, there's, there's often a tendency to, for people to do something more like an event analysis. So a, a quite descriptive, like this happened and then this happened and then this happened. That's not process mm -hmm. tracing in the sense of telling a causal story or, or a causal process. That's a descriptive kind of what happened, not why it happened. And our, we can get, we can cheat ourselves, kind of, because we put it, events in sequence, then your, your brain kind of wants to then impute that there is a causal relationship just because of the sequence. But unless you're able to actually explain like, what is it about this event? Like, what are people doing that actually can get me to the next spot? It's, it's, just, a, it's just a story. It's not a, a causal process that you've you've theorized so so that would be one of the things that 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 it really takes a lot of time is trying to 
not only understand what happened, but un giving it theoretical significance in a causal sense. And, and it's, a, it's a very labor intensive method, but on the other hand, you could say, well, any method that you do use well is gonna be very labor intensive. It's very difficult to design a good experiment. It's very difficult to do a good ethnog ethnogra uh, field study. It's very difficult and time consuming to do a good process tracing case study. And so typically in a PhD kind of, um, you know, three, four, five years, however long you have, uh, you might be able to do maybe one, two or three process tracing maybe combined with some kind of comparative analysis, um, both at the process level and then probably also just kind of conditions under what conditions type of comparison. That would probably be the, the typical design for a, for a process tracing in a, in a, in a PhD dissertation. Mm -hmm. So what about, uh, what about the empirics itself? So uh, the two of us talk about like all sorts of uh, what would be considered weird from a political science perspective, uh, use of process tracing potentially, but what would the typical process tracing study look like? What kind of evidences would it draw on? So the, the, the term of art, so um, there's different terms for this kind of basically the same thing. I like the term mechanistic evidence that actually comes from, from, from medicine. But the, the, the idea is that you've theorized a process and what you're theorizing is entities. So some kind of agent does something, an activity. And then activities, like if I vote or if I pay a politician a bribe, that activity leaves traces. So it's observational evidence that are the traces of activities taking place within a case. And in this respect, it's very different than if you think of an experiment, in your experiment, the evidence that you ideally want to use to be able to make a causal inference is what we would call manipulated evidence in the form of it's, it's, it's the, the, the actual manipulation and the difference between a, a treatment and a control group. And so it's the evidence of difference making that is manipulated and not observational. It's manipulated within the experimental design that really enables a strong causal inference, right? So that, that's what in the philosophy of science you say is evidence of difference making that in your experiment uh, enables you to make your inference. In process tracing, it's the mechanistic evidence, which is observational evidence of the traces of what happened within a case as far as the activities you know, that I can actually, uh, it, in some respects, it's, 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 it's no different than what we do if we wanted to figure out uh, in, a, in a crime, uh, you basically want to follow the money or you want to follow the traces that get me from A to B. And, yes. and so it's a very different type of, of, of evidence typically, and also a, often a lot more, um, you can't say there's one type of mechanistic evidence, it depends upon the activity. And one activity might leave many different types of traces. You might be able to tap into it by people saying, oh yeah, he did that. Or, or it might be, maybe there's a record that this person said that at the meeting or, or, or maybe uh, you can only more indirectly capture, you don't actually observe this activity taking place, but kind of the next part uh, and, and then kind of, kind of inferring back that, well, maybe that took place. Of course, then you would have a weaker inference. Um, so ideally you have quite direct evidence of each of these activities that are the, basically the linkages, uh, between parts that get you from, from A to B. And if you're able to unpack each of these parts, um, and, and, and provide quite strong direct evidence of, of, of all these linkages, the activities, uh, then you're able to make a strong causal inference. Mm -hmm. So actually, what I was getting at with this question, though, you, you went about answering it in a roundabout way, and uh, that was great, <laughs> actually, because it gave us a little more understanding of the process. But uh, where you look for these evidences is, is in what people said, in transcripts, in records, in, in archives, in conversations, in interviews, etc. So it... it does, does that sum up? Like yeah, the, or, or you could actually, resources? you actually could be present, right? Um, yeah. And, and there it maybe overlaps a little bit with, with things like we would say like ethnography, right? That, that, that it can also be things that you've actually observed. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some of us maybe get lucky enough to actually, you know, be in the room when political negotiations are taking place if you have that kind of access. So, so mm -hmm. it, but in theory, yeah, it could be all sorts of different things. It really depends upon what is relevant. And that's the term 
of art that you would use would be relevance is, is it tells us something about whether this activity took place. And so in theory, anything in, could be relevant evidence depending upon what activity you're trying to evidence. Mm -hmm. And if somebody learns process tracing, they will know exactly how to approach with what mindset to approach this kind of, well, information data, et cetera, with to be able to peel out the most useful and the most informative component from the perspective of, uh, well, you finished the sentence uh, from the perspective of, of um, well, uh, learning how things work. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's, exactly. that's the, it's, 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 so it's like, how does an epistemic community actually leverage its knowledge to be able to influence policy? And that's the kind of question that you would be, you'd be trying to evidence. That was great, Derek. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Thank you. Bye-bye.